a, cu a couple weeks ago when I was in uh, the previous chapter. Man, if this is the first time someone showed up to Calvary Chapel and I was teaching from this, these chapters here in Second Kings, they'd probably think we're crazy. Uh, even worse than that, though, if, if someone has never read the Bible and these are the, fir these are the first chapters that they're... Uh, everything okay up there? Man, I'm on. And these were the first chapters that they uh, read. Uh, I don't know if they'd ever read the Bible again. They would by the grace of God, but these are some crazy chapters. And, uh, but it's part of human history, and it's what we're capable of. It's so important that we understand that when we read the brutality and the wickedness, that every single one of you has the, in the seedbed of your heart, has the capacity to do the same thing. And that's why we just need to be so, so, just a sobering message and be real with ourselves that we need to stay close to the Lord's, close to God's people, close to, um, to Him in prayer. So with that... Let's read here, chapter 11. It says, When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. So what's going on here? Remember that by now there's been a, like a civil war and then a, a division of Israel. Ten tribes in the north, tribes of, of, uh, of Jacob in the north, and two in the south. The book of First and Second Kings follows both. It follows the northern ten tribes, and it calls the northern ten tribes Israel. It, it also follows, it switches back and forth, it follows the southern two tribes, which it calls Judah. The southern two tribes is the line of the Messiah, starting with David, which we were in way back in First and Second Samuel. Um, now we're dealing with D David's descendants, who are kings. But the key here in this chapter is that um, this woman, a Athaliah, she had married, uh, she, rather, she was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And if there's ever a good illustration in any book anywhere of what the influence, that the negative influence of a mother can be, um, it's this woman, Athaliah, who apparently learned a lot from her mother, but actually worse. I was talking with Stephanie about who the most wicked person in the Bible is. And uh, you may, you know, you may say Judas. Uh, maybe you're right. I think this woman is Judas times ten. I mean, uh, what she does here. I don't know if you caught what she does here. She is. Um, she was the mother of the king. And uh, her son, if you remember, Ahaziah, had gone up to the northern. Part, the northern ten tribes to hang out with that evil king up there. He never should have gone up there. But he was killed when he was up there by Jehu. And so it says in verse uh, 1 here that when she figured out her son was dead, she arose and she killed every one of her grandchildren who were males. Every single one of them. And there had to be a lot of them. because uh, At least... Uh, it appears that there were a lot of them because uh, there was actually one that was hidden. So apparently there were enough of them that one could be hidden um, and no one would notice. This is not the first time this happened in Israel. This just goes to show that the, at one point when they came into the promised land, they were delivered from Egypt. They were 40 years in the wilderness. They came into uh, the promised land, and under Joshua, 
who, remember, was Moses' assistant, but, assistant, but then he took over as, quote-unquote, the judge of Israel. He wasn't a king, but he was a judge, meaning he was a governor of Israel. Um, it says that that was a righteous generation. But the Bible says that when the people who lived under Joshua all died, the nation went back into a nosedive without the influence of those godly people. And in another horrific story, and it just goes to, it, it, uh, in Judges chapter 9, again, a, a story that really shows us how far we are capable as a society, but even individuals, if we just throw out the word of God and just live by the inclinations of our own heart. In Judges chapter 9, Abimelech, who was a son from a prostitute, uh, remember Gideon, Gideon saved Israel, but had his own, had some issues, he was a wonderful man, but he uh, had a son by a prostitute, and when his father uh, Gideon died, he, w- he, he went and killed all of his brothers, 70 of them. It says on one stone, he killed all of them. And um, here it happens again, but here's a woman who's looking at her own grandchildren and killing every single one of them so she can be queen. That is how low things get. And so we never see her, um, a, a, um, Athaliah's mother Jezebel doing such a thing, although she did a lot of evil things. She killed, tried to kill all the prophets in Israel, but her, oh, here's her own grandchildren. She puts, her, puts them all to death so that she can be queen of Israel, which she was for six or seven years. So with that, let's continue. <laughs> To, to, to read here, but Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. So while all his brothers were being murdered, they took the, uh, uh, the, a, a baby uh, away from um, what was going on, and um, they, it says they, they took, they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. Now, actually, this is in the temple. So they, they took him to the temple and hid him in the temple. It so happens, we know from Second Chronicles, that this woman, her name is Jehosheba, um, she was the daughter of the high priest. Um, she was also, I'm sorry, she was the, not the daughter, but the wife of the high priest. So she's the wife of the high priest of the time. We're going to find out his name is Jehoiada. She seizes, seizes the moment, takes the baby, and hides him from all the other people being murdered, and hides him in the temple. Verse 33, so he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Can you imagine this woman being your president, being your, the queen, and just the damage that would have been done in that time? Verse 4, in the seventh year, Jehoiada, now Jehoiada is the high priest, who's married to this woman who saved the, uh, the, the child from being murdered. Actually, he's the king. He's the king now from being murdered. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds and brought them into the house of the Lord to him. And he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. And so... Uh, you can just imagine. So what's the high priest? He's waiting on the Lord for six years. He's waiting for the right time. The queen, this queen, this wicked queen, Athaliah, who knows what's going on, um, doesn't realize that the real king is living in the temple, um, and she's just going on doing her wickedness. The, the, The high priest is waiting for the right time, and at the right time, it says in verse four, um, 
He brings the bodyguards together, the captains of hundreds, the bodyguards um, together, and he shows them the king. I tell you, this is like a made-for-TV movie right here. I mean, you can just imagine the people, these bodyguards, these army officers, and the drama of the scene, this is the king. And, and what that would have just done in their hearts. Now, to give you a picture of how incredibly important it was, to say the least, that this woman, Jehosheba, grabs the baby and runs to the temple and hides him, consider that if this wicked woman, Athaliah, had gotten hold of this baby and killed this baby too, that the promises of God would have been nullified. Because what? Because it's really, really clear in the Bible that the Messiah would be a descendant, a direct descendant, son to son to son to son, of King David. Um, Psalm 132 Verse 11 says, The Lord has sworn in truth to David. He will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. In other words, the Messiah will come from the seed of David. It also says, excuse me, to David himself, what did the Lord say? Um, The Lord said to David himself in 2 Samuel 7, verse 12, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his uh, kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And then just if, as, in case that didn't register with him, he tells him two more times, verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. And then a third time, just in case two times didn't register, your throne shall be established forever. If, if this kid, Joash is his name, this baby, had not been swept away and brought into the temple, the promises of God would have been nullified. I mean, actually, you can go look at your own history and you will see that the line from, even from David to the time of the exile where they were kicked out, what was it, like 300 years after David reigned, not to mention all the way to Jesus Christ, was, is by far the longest succession in the history of the world. Even if you just, um, even if you just go from David to who was the last king in Israel before the exile, Jehoiachin or something like that, that was something like 250, 300 years, or was it 400 years? It was about 350 years. Actually, it was about 350 years. If you look through human history, there's no reign that long. God was preserving the reign. Um, son to son to son to son to son, um, all the way to Jesus Christ, including this one here. By the way, if you do, if you look at your history, somewhere in the 1600s there was some other reign that went like 250 years, but nowhere near as long as as the reign from David to Jesus Christ. So, um, so anyway, uh, you can imagine the people who. It's, it's hard to describe the, how discouraged the people must have been who knew something about the word of God while a- Athaliah was reigning. It's like, God, maybe there is no God. We have been instructed from you that, the line of the Mas- that, that, that from the line of David that the, it will never cease, it will never end. From him the Messiah will come and, and it's been cut off. And, and, and there have been times in history um, of the church in the last 2,000 years. And who knows? I mean, I'm not a fear monger. Believe me, it drives me crazy when pastors um, try to get people shivering in their boots. But who knows? The time could come again, which has happened in the past in the church where just it looks like 
everyone, it, it, it looks like there's, the persecution gets so bad, it looks like the Christian church has no power anymore. It's like, where is God? Where's all his promises? Or, or there may be a time in your life where, you, you know, you, and you may be in this place tonight where, th- th- where things have gotten so bad that some promises that you have clung to for so long look like they've been cut off, they've been nullified, they're not true, they're nonsense, the, the devil is lying to you. Romans 8, 28, I, it's the most important verse in the Bible. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. If a Christian doesn't have that in his or her DNA, they are not going to have a fruitful life, Period. But when, you're th- with things in your, when things in your life get so bad, when the sky's falling down, when a spouse leaves, when a child dies, when someone who you love is in a tragic wreck and they're paralyzed, and I can go on and on and on. It's like, where is God in this? As crazy as this story is in 2 Kings, it's actually an encouragement, isn't it? The promises of God are never broken. Period. End of paragraph, like my English teacher or someone used to say. God knew what was going on, and, and sometimes when we look all around, and it just doesn't look like, it looks like the promises of God have failed, we need to cry out to the Lord, to cry out to the Lord, God, I need your grace just to even believe your promises anymore. But I tell you, this is, this is crazy as this chapter is. It's a good chapter to go to because we realize that God knows what was go- going on. He knows what was, is going on. We, all, we sometimes, oftentimes, don't. So anyway, in verse 4, he's just waiting on the Lord, this man of God, this tremendous man of God. His name is Jehoiada. And he calls the bodyguards together and the captains of the hundreds. And so these are these are either members of the these are either members of the army, but I think actually they're they're the 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 temple itself had its own system of of army officers. In fact, that's who went and arrested Jesus. There was a great multitude of temple officers that went and arrested Jesus and um, in Gethsemane when Jesus was. But I, I don't know if these are temple officers or he had just had the favor of the military here. Maybe that's, maybe I missed that and that's answered further down the chapter. But let's see what happens. He commanded them, verse 5, saying, this is what you shall do. One third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath. That's what makes me think these are Levites because um, the, outside, of the, outside of the one tribe, the Levites, um, you couldn't do, they didn't do service in the temple. But anyway, one third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. One third shall be at the gate of Sir, and one third of the gate behind the escorts. You shall keep the watch of the house, lest it be broken down. The two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord for the king. But you shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes within range, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. So yes, these are apparently Levites, meaning they're from the tribe of Levi and they've been assigned in some capacity of work on the temple grounds and, and, and now here um, they are put to the tax, task of defending the king. Verse 9, So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave the captains of hundreds the spears and shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. Then the escorts stood, every man with his weapon in his hand, all around the king from the right side of the temple to the left of the, te- of the temple by the altar in the house. So at this time, Athaliah doesn't know what's going on. The queen, and you can put that in sort of in 
quotes, because she really was not the queen. She's not really in any line of succession in Israel. She was an imposter, but she thinks she's queen, and people are behaving as she is the queen, but in God's eyes, she's not the queen. The king is this little boy. His name is Joash. And then Jehoiada, verse 12, <clears throat> says, He brought out the king's son, put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony, uh, meaning the, uh, th- the law. Uh, Deut- really quick aside, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, every time a man became, or a young boy became a king, they were required to write out the entire Mosaic law. <laughs> uh, I, I think that was not obeyed very often, but it's, an, it's just a wonderful verse to read, and it's encouraging because that's the, the heart of the Lord is for leaders to be godly men and women. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And then they made the king, middle of verse 12, and anointed him, and they made him king and anointed him. I mean, that would, would have been oil put on him. And they clapped their hands and said, long live the king. So you guys thought that was like a made-for-TV movie. For made-for-TV movies, you thought that was like the Middle Ages in England where that's an expression, long live the king. No, this is from the Bible <laughs> from the, the 2,500 years ago. Long live the king. So what's happening with the queen? Athaliah. One wicked woman. Now when Athaliah, verse 13, heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, there was... and And when she looked, there was the king standing by a pillar according to custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. So Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, Treason! Treason! And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains, of the, ar- the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, Take her outside under guard and slay her with the sword, whoever follows her. For the priest had said, Do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. So they seized her. And she went by the way of the horse's entrance into the king's house, and there she was killed. Verse 17. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people. Let's just read that again. It's an important little phrase. Jehoiada, the high priest, made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people, that they should be the Lord's people. And also between the king and the people. All the people just got up. They saw what happens when you leave the, the worship of Jehovah. They saw what happens when you let a leader in who doesn't honor the Lord. They saw the effect on their kingdom. And so there was a covenant made. And what was, what was the the heart and soul of the covenant, covenant, middle verse 17, that they should be the Lord's people. It's so comforting in prayer just to be able to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm your child. And I don't understand what's going on. I'm your people. I I, I am one of your people, Lord. So, could you please speak to me? Could you please, could you please, Lord, intercede in the situation I'm in? Would you please help my church, help my pastor, help the elders, help the worship team, help the ministry team? It's a comforting thing to know that you are of the people of God. This covenant that they made between the Lord, the King, and the people, that they should be the Lord's people. It's just an amazing thing that God 
would allow anyone to be called his people. I mean, just think about it. We take that for granted. That's the craziest thing in the world. That he allows anyone to be called his people. But he does, and he delights in doing it. He delights in his sons and daughters. I'm just speaking to you this evening. You are God's people. You are in the most indescribably privileged position. You're the Lord's people. You're God's daughter. You're God's son. He made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people that they should be the Lord's people and also between the king and the people. Verse 18, And all the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. They thoroughly broke it in pieces, its altars and images, and killed Madden, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. Just reading this morning, by the way, you know, Baal worship. You say, oh, this is really awful. They, call, they, they killed this, um, this priest of, of Baal. Well, a couple of things. Number one, this was required by the law of Moses. That if a leader led people astray, they were required to be put to death. Now, Jesus fulfilled all of that. We're under a different covenant. We're in a, we're in a completely different covenant. And those were fulfilled and no longer followed by us. Those were for Israel and Israel alone, those particular laws like that. But, you know, we read that, and if you're not a student of the Bible, and I hope every one of you are, but if you're not a student of the Bible, you don't realize Baal worship involved burning your own children. I was just reading this morning, oddly enough, Jeremiah 19, that part of Baal worship is bringing your own children and burning them, sacrificing them to the Lord. And so this is righteous judgment here. Um, again, it's not something that, that, it's part of a different covenant and a different part of the Bible, but um, it is righteous judgment what, what happens to this guy Matin, verse 19, then he took the captains of hundreds, and by the way, he is still, this is the high priest, Jehoiada. Then he took the captains of hundreds, the bodyguards, the escorts, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and went by the way of the gate of the escorts of the king's house. Then he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet for they had slain Athaliah with a sword in the king's house. Isn't that interesting that uh, she was slain, apparently slain by one of David's own swords. Isn't that interesting here? Because remember earlier, they had brought in David's, they had used David's swords and uh, given them to, to the officers. Verse 21, Jehoahash, he either goes by Jehoash or Josh, was seven years old when he became king. Chapter 12. By the way, the Bible says in Proverbs 11, verse 10, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. It says in verse 20, all the people of the land rejoiced when Athaliah was put to death. Chapter 12. Of Second Kings, chapter eleven. What time is it? Six fifty-five. No. no. What time is it? Seven twenty-six. This began at six fifty-five. So seven twenty-six. Okay. Chapter twelve. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash, again, that's the same little seven-year-old boy who had been hidden for six years in the temple, six, six and a half, something close to seven years, but that's who it's referring to here in verse one of chapter 12. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibia of Beersheba, Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada the priest 
instructed him. Now, we're going to see this guy go south like no one goes south after this high priest Jehoiada dies. So this high priest was a mentor. He was a tutor. He was someone who uh, this boy king, and then the boy grew up, of course, um, into a young man. And while he was a young man and, Je- and the high priest Jehoiada was still alive, he followed the counsel of this high priest. But he is going to, um, when, when, when the high priest Jehoiada goes off the scene, he's really going to go south in the worst way. In fact, he is going to kill the son of the very man Jehoiada who saved him. So, he's, so Jehoiada's going to die. And again, this is, I, I need to explain it now so, so to, to, to sort of explain this, this verse where it says, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So for about 20 years, he's doing okay. The high priest dies, but as soon as he gets under the influence of others, outside of the influence of of the high priest's son, whose name was Zechariah, said, no, I don't like that younger guy. He's my age anyway. Why should I listen to him? Gets under the influence of his friends or any. He starts worshiping other gods again. The high priest's son, the, the son of the high priest who saved him, his name is Zechariah, comes and confronts him over this, and he kills him. And every time I read this, you know, every time I read this verse, verse 2, Jehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada the, the priest instructed him. I just think, um, you know, what a, what a counterfeit walk with the Lord this guy had. It looked authentic, but it wasn't. You know, I think it's a tragedy when ever, well, let me just say this. I'm speaking to you here tonight at Calvary Chapel, you, 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 you men and women. Is there a person in your life that if they died or moved away, but if they died, because now, I guess with Facebook and I mean uh, with um, WhatsApp and and video conference calls you can have a closer contact. But if, if they died, you would go south yourself spiritually. Is there a person like that? If there is, that's a big problem. <laughs> you should not be overly dependent on any human being. It doesn't mean you don't go look for mentors. You should. If you don't have a mentor, you should have one. If you don't have someone discipling you, you should. It doesn't mean you don't go looking for discipleship, but it's a tragedy, for example, when a a pastor falls into adultery or something and people are falling off the map spiritually. That means that they were looking too much at him. Or if he dies. I get very grieved when people move to another part of the country after leaving Calvary Chapel and two years later, they're living in the gutter. They're weak if anything, that may be a bad reflection on me. Maybe I, I, didn't, I, I didn't foster them in an independent relationship with the Lord enough. They, they, they were too dependent on me on Sunday mornings or something. I'm not, I'm, I don't walk around in guilt about that, but I do need to at least ask the Lord, am I part of the problem? Now, obviously, people have gone away from here and they've done uh, and moved to other places and they've done fantastic. But, but, but why does that happen? It's, it's because... It's because, why does what happen? Why does someone move away from from a church and all of a sudden they go downhill spiritually? It's because they didn't develop their own independent relationship with the Lord. I haven't listened to Freddie's message from last Tuesday. You can kick me in the shin after the service for that. Not really, but I, I do need to listen to it. But I understand it was just awesome. Just Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus and receiving from the Lord. That's what all of you need. 
I'm not diminishing in the slightest way the importance of what goes on here on Tuesday night, Sunday morning, home fellowships during the week, uh, th- uh, things like that. People that you pray with individually, you should be doing all those things. But if you are not fostering your own relationship with the Lord, you're, you're going to be another Joe Ash. I'm just telling you right now. You're going to be throwing rocks at some awesome Christian young man or woman or old man or woman who, who tries to confront you as something, uh, or confront you on something because you, you took a nosedive after, you know, after you're doing okay, at least on the outside for, for years. And listen, I'm speaking to my own heart. I, I, I know these are, these are hard things, but this guy started off so well. As, as we'll see, he's going to do some good things here. But he ends up killing. He, he, I'm, we're not going to read it actually in, in, in Kings. You have to read in Chronicles, in chapter 23 of Chronicles, I think it is. But, but he's going to wind up killing the son of the man who saved him because he didn't have his own individual relationship with the Lord. He, he was under his influence and followed him while he was around. But as soon as he, was, he died um, again, Je- Jehoash did, verse 2, what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. Verse 3, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. That was a prohibition um, in, in, in the word of God that at this time they were to be, they were to be sacrificing you know, the lambs and animals and stuff like that, only in the temple in Jerusalem. Only in the temple in Jerusalem. Um, but they, you know, what they, what they did is Jerusalem was for, too far away and they got these high places and they kept on doing their stuff. Hezekiah, we'll read about Hezekiah eventually. It's just incredibly great revival under Hezekiah. Does away with all the high places. One of the only um, kings to do that. But um, verse 4, And Jehoash said to the priests, so we'll see here, he's, he's, he's going to start off pretty good. He said to the priests, all the money of the, of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation <laughs> is found. And so, man, you put the temple in, uh, uh, under Athaliah, that wicked queen, and then also of uh, Athaliah's son, Ahaziah. They hadn't taken care of the temple. They worshipped foreign gods, whatever. So the temple had gone into to disrepair. I can't help but thinking of our own city, Boston, their churches are not in disrepair. They're just being sold and turned into condos. We should be crying out to the Lord for a, a reversal um, of that. But anyway, it says in verse 6, now it was so by the 23rd year of King Joash that the priest had not repaired the damages um, of the temple. So King Joash called Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, why have you not repaired the damages of the temple? Now therefore do not take more money from your constituency but deliver it for repairing the damages of the temple. So apparently they had been dragging their feet. You see, he's, he's, he's under the influence of this man of God by the name of Jehoiada and he's keeping the priests accountable. Verse 8, and the priests agreed that they would not neither receive more money from the people nor repair the damages of the temple. Then Jehoiada the priest took a chest, bore a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who kept the door put there, uh, put there all the money brought into the house of the Lord. So it was, whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribes and the high priest came up and put it in bags and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. Then they gave the money which had been apportioned into the hands of those who did the work, who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, 
and they paid it out to the carpenters and builders who worked on the house of the Lord and to masons and stone cutters for buying timber and hewn stone to repair the damage of the house of the Lord and for all that was paid out to repair the temple. And so there's a great investment here in a building. Now we know the church is not a building. In fact, Stephen, when he's quote he's speaking in Acts chapter seven, says the temple isn't really wasn't even where God was. God, the heavens and earth can't contain God. Stephen said. However, it is important to invest in the place where the people of God meet, that it not be in disrepair, and that people give sacrificially to that to facilitate the teaching of God's word. In this case here, this is sacrifices, and that all, every single one of those sacrifices, there was, it was required by the law that, that there would be a sacrifice in the temple, um, in the temple, at least on the altar, of, of sacrifice a lamb every morning and every evening. And each one of those lambs was a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And so it's a disgrace when the temple is in, in, in disrepair when such an important function is happening. Every morning and every evening there's a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God being sacrificed. It's, and it's a disgrace uh, today, if a church is not um, able to afford, uh, basically, to, to go from um, week to week and, and do what it needs to do, whether it's a building or whether it's just paying rent or having staff or what, whatever it is um, that's needed. And so um, he's starting off good here, but unfortunately it's shallow. It's really... He's doing it at the direction of the high priest Jehoiada. Verse 13, however, there were, they, there were not made... <clears throat> Verse 13, however, there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver trimmers, sprinkle bowls, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, any articles of gold or all articles of silver from the money brought into the house of the Lord, but they gave that to the workmen and they repaired the house of the Lord with it. Moreover, they did not require an account from the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to workmen, for they dealt faithfully. I kind of scratch my head every time I read verse 15 there because I don't know that anyone should take that and imitate it. There should always be accountability when there, when, whenever there's anything to do uh, with money. There's a requirement that the counters at our church um, always have someone else present. You ever see Solomon, that guy back there? Oh, here he is. He's coming in. He doesn't know I'm talking about him. If you ever see Solomon counting money alone, you have permission to go up and rebuke him. <laughs> <laughs> or Osagi, um, because w we introduce accountability just because we're all capable of doing something real stupid. And, and, and so, um, but here, <laughs> every time I read this verse, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to take from this verse? Apparently, it, it is a, a great thing. The workmen and the managers were so faithful that they, they just, they were faithful with the money of God. And that's like a good thing, right? Verse 16, the money from the trespass offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to the priests. And so, <clears throat> verse 17 switches. Well, it doesn't switch. It, it, what happens in verse 17 is an enemy of Israel and Judah, Haziel, king of Israel, Syria went up and fought against Gath. Gath is where? Someone shouted out. Where's Gath? Where's Gath? Philistine, in Philistia. So one of the city states in the land of the Philistines. Who is from Gath? Goliath. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't ask you. All right. You got it. Yes, you got it. Goliath. Goliath was from Gath. But he... Uh, 
he, Haziel, this, this king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. Then Haziel set his face to go up to Jerusalem. Now, if you read this chapter in conjunction with Second Chronicles, by this time, Jehoiada the high priest is dead. So this guy, uh, Jehoash, probably shouldn't call him this guy, this king, Jehoash, out of the influence, probably for a number of years, from the high priest uh, Jehoiada, and now this happens in verse 18. Again, he's no longer under the influence of Jehoiada. It says, And Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the sacred thing, things that his fathers Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own sacred things, and all the gold found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and in the king's house, and sent them to Haziel, king of Syria. Then he went away from Jerusalem. So here you see a serious act of compromise. I, on Sunday, I, I listened to um, Luis's message, which I thought was an outstanding message. And he made this point that... Um, you know, the, he said of David that the world is going to give you its own way to fight your battles. Like Saul wanted David to fight his battles with his own armor. And the world is going to tell you to fight your battles with another, just its, its own kind of different ways that it fights, but that are not spiritual. So this is a classic thing in the world. If there's a problem, well, just take out a big loan and just give them money so they'll go away. That's what he did here. He didn't rely on the Lord. Why? Because he was no longer under the, um, he was no longer under the influence of the, of the high priest Jehoiada. What should he have said? Same thing as David said. What is going on here? There's a, an uncircumcised army outside of Jerusalem. We just need to get up and we need to fight them. That's what David said. All Israel cowering in fear. This guy could have done the same thing. He may have said that if Jehoiada was still around. The high priest was still around, but he was gone by this time. And so, um, so Second Chronicles gets much, much more in detail on what happened there. Verse 19 says, Now the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the books, book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? That's what we're going to get in after we finish Second Kings, God willing. Verse 20, and his servants arose and formed a conspiracy and killed Joash in the house of Milo, which goes down to Selah. So his own servants wind up killing him. So Second Kings here leaves out a lot of detail, <laughs> including the fact that uh, he killed the son of Jehoiada, the very man who killed him and, and did all kinds of other bad things as well. His own servants rise up and killed him. Uh, verse 21, for Jozakar, the sons of Shimeath and Jehoshaphat, the son of Jomer, his servant struck him. So he died and they buried him with his father in the city of David. Then Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place.